Step into the unknown with Paranormal M. Subscribe, hit the notification bell, and prepare to be captivated by our latest stories that push the boundaries of belief. We hope you enjoy the journey into the mystical and strange. Lost Girl Over the years, I have seen and sensed the presence of spirits. I've only spoken to one in a short conversation, like ten years ago. I live in a suburb of Los Angeles, so it's a small street with houses up and down the streets. Tree-lined sidewalks, a few street lamps. I remembered that I needed to take out the trash, and to bring it to the curb for pickup. When I walked out, I looked up and down the street. No one was there, the street was dark and silent, with a breeze that's pretty usual for the area. When I was done, I was surprised to see a teenage girl walking down the sidewalk toward me. The street lights were like a half block away, and they were sort of covered by tree branches that moved in the breeze. Because of the lighting, she was in blue tones. She was walking slowly, looking from side to side. But her look, I suspected she might be blonde or maybe a redhead. Five foot seven, maybe. White, like pleasant blouse, a gypsy skirt, sandals. Kind of like a hippie, but I've seen girls dress this way currently, so wasn't that out of place. She seemed lost or high, but her presence at this time of night was out of place. When she got within 15 feet, I asked her if she was okay or if she needed help. She said no, but didn't look at me, and then said I'm looking for my friend's house. It has an alley behind it. I told her all the houses here have alleys. She said that she'll find it. She never looked at me, just at the houses, and she also never stopped walking toward me. The tree branches shifted in the breeze and the light ran across her face. At that moment, I realized she had no eyes. I could see into her eye sockets for a moment. She was five feet away at this point, and I was frozen in place. All I could say at this point was, do you want me to tell anyone or anything? Call them. She walked right past me on the sidewalk. She didn't stop or look at me, but said, no, I'll find them. Frozen, I watched her. She walked 20 feet to the tree. That's where the street lamp was covered. She sank into the shadow of the tree trunk on the sidewalk. I made my way home, but kept looking out my window for a few hours. I still get nervous when I walk outside around there. I'm done. As a supervisor at a local government facility, I really can't say which ones though, but I've worked at different ones over the last 20 years. This story is second hand, but at the moment just after it happened. The supervisor from another department came over confused and said, Can you believe this crap? I asked him what happened. He said the phone repairman just walked off the job. I was thinking of something mundane, and he said that when he asked the phone repairman why it was packing up, the response was, That woman. And he kept packing. The supervisor asked, what woman? The repair guy said, the one with the 1940s hairstyle. The supervisor said, what girl? What'd she say? The repair guy said nothing. She was watching me unpack my tools and then walk through that wall, then proceeded to walk out and leave. I asked what this facility was prior. He said it was an old landfill, but it was popular lover's lane in the 1950s. Seeing how it overlooks the Los Angeles basin makes sense. He didn't know much else, 
couldn't find anything to back up other than the view. Make it pretty good for, well, that facility wasn't there. Great party, Dad. This happened a few years ago. My mother called me and told me that she was going to have a birthday party for my father. We usually have dinner, so a party was something different. I wasn't in the mood for it, only because he's a realtor. A ton of people I don't know would be there. Add to the fact that the house has a medium backyard with a pool. The lighting sucks, so your standing room only in the house and in the near dark with little more room outside. It was all okay. I did my best to be social, but I stayed in the backyard for the most part. Looking around, I noticed a woman. She had like a seven-year-old. It was a boy, basically at her hip. Anytime they caught my eye, he had his arms around her waist. He was looking at me, blankly. I didn't approach them. I thought maybe he was autistic or something, but it seemed odd to bring him to this. When it thinned out, my sister-in-law asked me, What'd you see? I said, Like... She said, I felt something in the backyard, but you can see it. I said, I didn't see anything strange. I said that people shouldn't be bringing kids to adult parties that run this late. Especially if something's, you know, not okay with them. She said, What child? I pointed out the woman and said, I guess they had enough sense to take the boy home. She looked at me horrified. There was no boy. That woman lost her son a few years back to cancer. I was told later that there were no children at that party. I drove home freezing the whole time couldn't get past the boy's blank expression. I am here. Years ago, I dated a woman named Patty. She was ten years my senior, but I didn't care. She had three kids and I practically lived with her for a few years. She'd been orphaned for about ten years and, well, raised by a few aunts. One of them I had not met had gotten sick. It was both emotionally, well, was both the emotionally closest, and they stopped talking in her fifteen years prior. That was confusing. We went to the hospital, but she was unresponsive. I met her family and figured out that there was quite some anguish had by this lady when they parted ways. There was nothing to be done, so we went home, put the kids to sleep and laid down. Not even ten minutes later we could hear footsteps outside and crunching leaves. I got dressed, and as I was going to the door, I heard three. Thumps on the wall hard. I hurried out, nothing, not around, no signs of anything. We went to bed again under an hour, the bathroom sink just turned on full blast, hot and cold water. I was less than five feet away, so it wasn't a person. I turned off the water, and less than an hour later, it happened again. We both stayed up after turning the water off. Less than two minutes after, we got the call. Her aunt had just passed away. Because of the whirlwind after that, I'd forgotten what really happened until right now that it popped into my head. I assume it take quite a bit of energy to turn on faucets. Me think so, too. Bad Neighborhood Back in 1997, I lived somewhere that one might call a bad neighborhood. It was in the San Fernando Valley, 
so it wasn't the worst L.A. had to offer. The apartment was under the stairs, halfway to the back. The rent was cheaper than the other apartments, and I was glad to have gotten it. It was just me and my girlfriend at the time living there. What was odd off the bat was that it had two steps from the door to the floor of the apartment. I don't know why, and it was the only one. What it did do was make it cooler, almost cold all the time despite the outside temperature. The kitchen and living room were open to each other, and the door led to the bedroom. You could see 80% of the apartment from the bedroom. The first odd thing, well, that happened, was at night I could hear someone walking around outside my door in the knock. Sometimes I was in the living room. Sometimes I was in the living room and could clearly see that no one was out there. A few weeks the TV or radio would turn on and then the volume would go up. At the time I figured that somebody had similar electronics and that was causing it wasn't until a drawer came open in the kitchen that something fell on the floor late one night. It was my knife drawer, and the chef's knife was on the floor. I was in my bedroom, and I could see across the apartment. No one had been there. I started asking the neighbors, but they mostly were mostly wanting to keep to themselves. The next night I woke up to quiet sobbing that stopped when I went into the living room. The next day, I, well, I struck up a conversation with an older resident. I asked about my apartment, and he smiled. He told me a few years back there were some gang members that lived there. They used to make a noise and trouble, and everyone stayed away from them. One day they got in a fight in the apartment and stabbed someone to death. They just up and left him there took a week or so to call the police. Then it started smelling. They couldn't get the smell out because it was in the subfloor. The solution was to tear it out and carpet and tile the cement under it. Looking at the rough cement, one foot around the whole apartment made sense. He then told me that there's more. I was like, great. He, the next people who lived there, had a teenage daughter, and she had a boyfriend in the building. They broke up later, and he would watch her come and go with hate in his eyes. Lucky for he, he did not hurt her physically. But what he did do is hang himself on the stairs just outside her door, looking at it. He knew she left for work early, and of course she found him. Later I talked to the lady that lived in the apartment where they dead boyfriend lived and she said they could hear someone opening her door then walk down the hallway toward my apartment. I did not renew my lease after a year of ghosts and the actually dangerous gang member that lived in and these apartments. I'm reading it as is. West Hollywood Ghost In the year and a half I was assigned to work a police station in West Hollywood, I saw many strange things, but most of them are for different forms than this. I had contact with trustees, and they would talk briefly from time to time, but I was working for most of the day. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's basically prisoners that are non-violent and have a small sentence that live in the station doing menial jobs. One day one comes up to me, says that he couldn't sleep because there was thumping in the bathroom next to their dorm. I was like, well, mostly likely pipes and just deal with it. I went back to work. After the weekend I saw him and he looked very tired. He tells me that that thumping continued and he could hear gagging quietly. He went in the bathroom and no one was there, and the noise stopped. The days would pass, and now several of them were looking not rested. They said they can all hear it. I said, mention it to the person in charge of you. He told me that they did, 
that they got threatened to get sent back to regular prison if they keep bothering him. Sounded typical, but I was feeling kind of bad as they were kind of looking scared and tired. When I ran into the person in charge of them, he said that that complaint came up every now and then. There's nothing really they could do. Everyone knew that five year prior a trustee hung himself in that bathroom while everyone was sleeping. The problem would solve itself when the scared prisoners asked to be sent back to regular prison. There's nothing I could do, so I decided not to tell them. Nothing good would come of it. They were all gone by the next week, and their replacements must have been heavy sleepers, because I didn't hear really anything about it after that. Anybody else remember that story? Excuse you, car. Night Jogging I can't really say why I did this. I know it wasn't really for my health. After night classes at a tech school, my and my friend had time. We got out at about ten, and in those years this was early. He asked if there was any tracks open to jog in. Burbank was too far, and I told him I knew a place. I had been taken the year prior by a friend that liked local anomalies. I drove to the hills, where the 210 and the 118 meet. In the hills, maybe 15 minutes in there, is a graveyard called Glen Haven. According to my other friend, the year prior is very haunted. It has no walls, and it's across the street from another graveyard that does have fencing. Down the road from it has a gravity hill that pushes your car uphill. Down further, there's a bar that had people that would chase you out if you weren't their type of people. Getting deja vu again. I feel like I've read this story. At the end of the hall, you bump into a walkway that goes under the 210 freeway. Supposedly, someone was killed there, and you can hear this screaming if you go in the middle of the night. The gravity hill is real, the bar is always closed when I've gone, and I heard the screaming at the walkway, but I can see it being an echo. But the graveyard. Me and my friend walked out, and I told him that we could run across and back for exercise. After some debate, I told him it was forced conditioning. We would be compelled not to stop until we got back. I didn't know how right I was. By then it was almost 11 p.m. and we started our run. Started to hear a little girl giggling. As we continued, I, because there is no lights in or around the graveyard, I could see what looked like fireflies. They're not native to Southern California, at least. I've never seen them here. We started detecting movement by the time we reached the other side and started running back, almost in a panic. By this time, we could fully hear footsteps behind us, and both of us refused to turn around. When we jumped off the curb onto the road, it all stopped. The whole place was silent. It scared the hell out of us. On the way back, I said, no one better chase us, I'm not in the mood. We did this once a week with the same results for a month. After that, we found something else to do that was less frightening. Being macho, we were like, that's boring. But we were really scared. I can admit that now. My great-grandmother's paranormal experience. I was told this by my father when I asked him for stories while doing my family tree. My great-grandfather had been murdered in 1938. I had found his death certificate from Mexico City. Something to the effect of massive head trauma. My dad tells me that his wife had two small children in the house. She was fearful that whoever killed her husband would kill her and her children. She would sleep at the front door with her children face out so she could see into the door if anyone was coming. 
because she lost all income, she rented a room to an old lady named Kona. Every morning she would come out of her room dragging her slippers on the floor one step after the other. One day Kona didn't come out of her room. It turned out that she had died. The brought the neighbor doctor, and he said, yeah, she passed away. In that poor neighborhood, they did wakes in the house. So the neighbors set up in the kitchen table and started praying. Suddenly Kona screamed and sat up yelling about how she went down a hallway to a large book that contained all of her sins. She said she would cover her eyes but could still see them. She said it was horrible. She then faded and died again. After everybody was done shaking, the doctor was called again and he said, This time, she's really dead. Unamused, the funeral continued, and Kona was buried the next morning. My great-grandmother closed Kona's room, went back to sleep looking out the crack at the bottom of the front door. In the middle of the night, she heard the door open, and then the she, she, she. of Kona's slippers across the floor. She was frozen, started praying, but wouldn't stop. She then remembered that somebody told her if she cussed out the ghost and it was a pure soul, it would leave. She got up, started cussing Kona out. In the pitch black, the spirit ran into her and threw her on the floor and left the house. Find it interesting that Kona had warned everyone when she came back briefly that she was not a pure spirit. This is my story. Okay, so this took place 12 or 13 years ago. I was 18 when this happened. But I swear I remember what happened this night clearer than most I've had. On this particular night, I was a designated sober driver. As I had recently broken my hand playing rugby, and after I had made my last drop-off around 1 a.m., I decided I would call it a night. As I was driving home, I was approaching a local historic house slash reserve named Caputoy. For reference, um, outside of this house, which was sort of appearing to be like a hitchhiker. I obviously thought that this was weird as hell, because being rugby season is pretty damn cold at 1am. Due to the recent spate of break-ins in the area, I honestly considered picking up this quote-unquote hitchhiker. Thought maybe they'd be safer crashing at my parents for the night than on the streets of Belfast Christchurch. As I got closer to this hitchhiker, I got a look at their face. Now, this is going to sound bizarre, and it's difficult to explain clearly, but the best I can do is to liken the face to an old brown leathery volleyball type thing. I felt my blood run cold as I quickly accelerated away. After a couple of seconds, I looked in my rearview mirror. There was nothing there. Now, proper scared, I practically raced home. Once I got inside, I saw my parents just about to go to bed. My mom says, Are you okay, Isaac? You look like you've just seen a ghost. I was just, Uh, it's funny that you say that, as I recounted what I had just experienced. A couple of weeks later, I was having a conversation with my mom about some other bullshit that I can't remember nowadays. She mentions that she told my uncle about what I had said. I was told that the apparent story of a hitchhiker that had been murdered after being picked up outside of Kapitoli House. Now I'm unsure if that's true at all, but the whole thing made me think differently about the idea of ghosts. And I never believed before this night, and now I do. Donner Pass 
last night I experienced something very disturbing on Donner Pass in Truckee, California. The area is known for being haunted because it has a rich history of death and violence, i.e. the Donner Party named biggest one. But being born and raised in Reno, I've been to Truckee hundreds of times, and I've never experienced something quite this disturbing. My fiancé and I went to Northern California to visit his family for Christmas. We didn't leave his family's house until 6.30 p.m. We had about a five-hour drive ahead of us to get home. By the time we got close to Truckee, I had realized that I'd made a mistake not taking a bathroom break at the last gas station that we stopped at in Yuba City, as every gas station after that is closed for Christmas. But... By the time we hit Donner Pass, around 10.30 or 11 p.m., I thought my bladder was going to explode in my body if we didn't stop. I was expecting to have to wait until we got to the Arco at the bottom of the pass. But to my surprise, there was a big rest stop at the top of the pass. I remind everyone that I've driven through this pass hundreds of times. Never noticed this rest stop. As soon as we pulled up to this stop, I immediately felt uneasy felt a fight-or-flight instinct to kick in that I've never felt in Truckee before. I've gone to Truckee to investigate paranormal activity multiple times. But my need to use the restroom outweighed by an easy feeling. In the parking lot was one car. A blue car. Could have been a Honda, but I honestly didn't look too closely because the man standing next to the car looked completely normal and harmless. Made me feel like a rabbit in the face of a wolf. I couldn't figure out why I was so scared of this man. I dismissed it on a late night paranoia, got out of the car. I had to pass this man to get to the building, the bathroom in it. But the closer I got to him, the more panic I felt. To the point where I stopped in my tracks and waited for my fiancé to walk in front of me. He stopped when I did though, seemingly because he caught the same creepy vibe from the guy that I did but then walked in front of me anyways. He's a real sweetheart, and I'm so lucky. The entire walk from the car to the building, the man looked almost through my fiancé and at me, had a really creepy smile on his face the entire time. It made my fiancé so uncomfortable that he put his keys in between his knuckles in case he had to fight the guy. When we walked into the building, things got really weird really fast. As soon as we opened the doors, my vision became strange. I tried focusing my eyes on the sides of the building, but no matter how hard I tried, my eyes just kept unfocusing themselves. It freaked me out, but I dismissed it on a long, dark drive, contrasting the bright lights in the building and walked toward the woman's restroom. The men's restroom was on the left, and the women's was on the right, and both had two sides to choose from. My fiancé needed to use the restroom himself, so I assumed we were going separate ways and ran into the left side of the women's restroom. As soon as I turned the corner, I was immediately even more creeped out because there was toilet paper all over the floor. It looked like three or four rolls had been unraveled all over the place. But again, I dismissed it as tweakers doing weird shit at a rest stop, took a deep breath, opened the first stall clogged and disgusting. So then I moved to the second stall. Clogged and disgusting. Then I moved to the third stall. But as I reached for the door, I got a sinking feeling that someone was behind the door and I backed up. I looked under the stall and saw a woman's feet. She was wearing black small-heeled shoes with a weird-looking silver buckle on them. And under her feet was what looked like a puddle of water. It looked like this woman was soaking wet, dripping all over the floor. It spooked me, so I turned around and went to the other side of the bathroom to try those stalls. When I got to the other side as I was passing the mirrors, I glanced toward them and saw a woman following me in the reflection. She was about my height, I'm 5'2", maybe a little taller, black hair, she was wearing a white turtleneck button-up shirt and a black skirt that was long enough to reach below the mirrors. 
She was soaking wet. And she had makeup on that made it look like she was painted by somebody else. But the creepiest feature I saw was her eyes. I'm not new to seeing the dead. Sensitivity runs my family. But I've never seen a ghost that looks like this. Her eyes were grayed out the way a corpse's eyes do after a few hours of passing. I worked at a morgue a few years ago. It's the only reason I know what that looks like. Usually when I see ghosts, they have normal eyes. But hers were different. They were wrong. It scared me to death. I ran into a stall and locked the door. I heard her footsteps come up to the stall. And I saw the shoes that I saw in the other stall from under my own stall. I cannot make this sh shit up. The woman started aggressively trying to open the stall. I was pulling back from the inside and she was pulling back from the outside with the force of a living person. Then suddenly it stopped. I said out loud, what the actual fuck? Took a deep breath, sat down to finally just use the damn bathroom when I heard a loud, fast footstep come from outside of the bathroom. I was going into the side I was on saw brown leather suede boots running into the bathroom and toward my stall. And at this point, I've had it with the ghost crap, so I stood up, closed my eyes, ran out of the bathroom. My fiancé was standing outside of the bathroom, apparently waiting for me because the guy outside creeped me out so bad he didn't feel like I was going to be safe going to the bathroom. He told me he was standing there the entire time waiting for me. I told him to get me the fuck out of that building. I wanted to go home. He asked me what happened, and who he heard in the bathroom with me, and why I said, what the actual fuck? And it dawned on me, this was not something that only I had experienced, but that he had also heard happening. So I told him, I think I saw a ghost, and that we just needed to leave. When we walked out of the building, the same guy was standing by his car watching us. I looked down at his shoes, and he was wearing the same suede brown boots that I thought I'd seen in the bathroom. When we drove away, my fiancé said, That guy gave me serial killer vibes. He was looking at you like he was hunting you. It really freaked me out. I wouldn't be shocked if we saw that man again in the news. And when I told him about my experience in the bathroom... He felt that it was possible he had hurt someone there before. She was trying to warn me. He also expressed that he had the same experience with a weird change in vision when we walked in. However, again, this could have just been a change from the dark to a bright room. Can't get her face out of my head. and I'm worried that that guy did hurt her. And he'll hurt someone else. My fiancé is a marine veteran. He doesn't spook easily and he's met a lot of violent murderers. So when he says he recognized him as somebody that wanted to hurt me, I believed him wholeheartedly. Any thoughts? Has anyone experienced anything like this before? A very regretful Ouija board experience. So this happened years ago in about 2019. I was over at a friend's house. We had a good amount of people to play with their Ouija board. Maybe five or so people. I want to preface this by mentioning the board we were using was used before to summon the well-known Ouija demon known as Zozo by the person who owned the board. They supposedly sold their soul to Zozo for the demon to protect them from their biggest fear which was being in a car crash, or something similar to do with cars in that way. Anyways, we started playing. We circled the board with the planchette to warm the board up, began asking questions. It began to answer, responding yes to if there was a spirit with us, and answering basic questions such as its name, how old it was, and why it died, which it gave answers to. I believe the first spirit had answered hospital. The group I was playing with began to ask dumb and all too playful questions, and not taking it seriously, even making fun of me when I chastised them for not being serious about it. 
I stopped playing with them after a while. I remember their non-serious nature went on for a while too, but as they continued to ask questions, they all had gone silent and had seemed to become entranced by the board, deeply focusing on having a very, very long session with it. I had tuned out most of this and hanging out with my other friend on the couch who had also not opted into the session. This wasn't that. I wasn't interested in playing, necessarily. I just had no tolerance for the group not taking the game seriously. I've always experienced paranormal shit since I was a baby in every single one of my households I've ever lived in prior. I was really sensitive to the paranormal, actually. This was my first experience with the board before I was followed by something. I asked to borrow the Ouija board. My friend gave me permission. This marks the next time I played the board, which, this is going to be very dumb and cliche, but the day was Friday the 13th, and I decided to play in Cal Anderson Park in Capitol Hill in Seattle, Washington. My friend and I took the board to the park. I managed to find a few strangers to play with. My next mistake. We sat down, circled the board, and I took to asking the questions. The spirit I'd managed to contact began to give me random letters as opposed to the previous session having clear English written out. I asked if this was Latin, as I knew if the board began speaking Latin, you're supposed to end the session. It answered yes. Then I asked if it was a negative spirit. It answered yes. Then I, well, my next mistake, I asked it permission if I could end the session. It told me no, then began to circle the board in wide circles. I got really uncomfortable, tried to push the planchette to goodbye, and a strong force pushed against the planchette, not allowing me to pull it to goodbye. I did manage to push it to goodbye after some more force, told the spirit that it was not allowed to contact me again. I cut contact with the session, flipped the board, believing the session was cut off, but left a deep feeling of dread in my stomach like something wasn't right. And that feeling was correct. My ex and I had kept the board at his house. Kept it in his shed for some time after that. As when we kept it in his house, strange things would happen, such as footsteps and doors closing and opening, knocks underneath the floor and his doorknob wiggling, and some other happenings. We returned the board to the original owner after this, the one who had summoned Zozo with it. We didn't want it around anymore, and the owner had apparently wanted it back. After all of this, a spirit followed me home. I would hear footsteps running up and down my stairs outside my bedroom. I would wake up freezing cold with a deep feeling of dread and a figure at the foot of my bed. One night there was a heavy banging noise in the garage, which my parents blamed on me, to which I frantically responded, See? Something isn't right. Something did follow me home from the Ouija board. They began believing me more that night after the banging. I was so scared during this time that I sprinkled salt around my entire bed and door frame, smudged with white sage before I knew it was closed practice slept with crosses and a Bible on my bedside and prayed to God every night. I became extremely spiritual around this time because I honestly had no idea what else to do or where to turn. I just wanted the haunting to stop. One morning my ex and I heard my mom knock on the bedroom door. She asked us, Why are you guys sleeping still? He got aggravated at my mom waking us up so early. I checked the time and it was 7 a.m., which is really unlike my mom to be wondering why we were still sleeping at that time. When I went upstairs a bit annoyed to ask her about it, she was on FaceTime with my sister's kid in the living room. I had no idea what I was talking about. My mom isn't the type to prank me like that or lie, and she was really busy with the FaceTime call at the time that it happened. Honestly, think back and wonder whatever asked us why we were sleeping was mimicking my mom or if it was an entirely different woman's voice, 
We had just chalked it up to being my mom, since that's the only lady in the house. The thought still makes me sick, honestly. The person who owned the board who summoned demons with it was also extremely troubled and ended up committing suicide a year or two after stopping, well, after I stopped being friends with them. Haven't touched a Ouija board since, and the experience left me with some trauma. I still sleep with the lights on, and I still did continue to use my pendulums and tarot cards and practice with gems and scrying, but I never touched a board again, I never will. The concept interests me still, and the fact I did have some sort of profound experience, I'm just not sure if I'm morbidly lucky to have had. I'm just glad that things, well, that followed me home stopped contact after some time, right? My Weird Experience been thinking about this ever since I saw it as a kid. This was probably around 2000-2001. I remember telling my friends at school about what I saw. They thought I was making it up. Well, I grew up in North Jersey. I shared a room with my younger brother at that time. We had bunk beds. I slept on the top bunk. One night, I think I was, well, I think it was fall or early winter. It was a pretty loud storm, and it was raining pretty hard. The sounds of rain on the roof was pretty loud, from what I remember. Our house was right across from a strip mall, so there were sounds of semis coming and going maybe two to three times a day. They'd usually come to stock the grocery store. I was pretty good at recognizing those sounds. But this night it sounded like the semi was driving on top of gravel right outside the house. It was a different sound than the rain. It was so loud and bizarre that I remember waking up. It definitely wasn't thunder either. From what I can remember, I was just lying awake and from the corner of my eye I see what I thought was a laser pointer pointing through the window. It's giving me chills typing this out. It wasn't just one dot though. It was a triangle of dots kind of scanning my room. It happened in like two seconds and then it was gone. So our bedroom was on the second story of the house, and our window faced the backyard with the woods being behind it. So it's not like somebody could just be shining the laser pointer in because of the angle of how it moved through the room. I was on the top bunk watching as it moved. The incident's angle was above my elevation, but from outside. Could this have been a drone? I have, well, I have such a hard time believing that because it was raining so hard. I doubt even a helicopter would be cleared to fly in a storm like that. What the hell did I see that night? I felt it touch me. I fell asleep at around 4 a.m. I woke up at 5 a.m. I was at a sort of camping place with people I knew and some I didn't. Around a hundred feet away, there was another camp I had to get to, but it was already dusk, turning everything around these camps pitch black. I had to make my way to the other camp, and a kid from my school happens to be there. He tells me the way. I'm really afraid of the dark, but I see some people coming and going between the two camps. So I toughen it up, grab my phone, and make my way there. Making my way to start the trail, there's a small ditch only two feet deep going around the camp. I set foot down in it in order to reach the trail. When I take another step, my body goes limp, as if God or a being much more powerful than me commanded fall. I collapsed in the ground in an almost paralyzed state. I felt a hand curl around my ankle and drag me into the woods. All I could think was, this is the end, and I could only pray. I could only groan for help. It was blood-curdling, and the way I was being dragged, the hand had no sway to it, 
It was being hauled like at constant speed. Something of inhuman precision and strength was taking me away. Here's where it gets worse. I start to feel the inside of the top right arm muscle and my entire right shoulder tickle. Not pleasant, but a violating sensation. The sensation is followed by a feeling of old, spindly fingers making their way up my shoulder toward my neck. And at this point I was awake, so I didn't feel the drag anymore, but I was fully aware of the fingers touching me. I had two options. Scream and fight waking my friend up, or slowly turn to my side in hopes it went away. I chose to slowly turn, pretending to be asleep, and as I began to turn my body to my right side, the fingers began to creep away from my neck down my shoulders. Afterward, I picked my phone up under my rib and covered my head with my blanket. What's extremely worrying is that when I'm sleeping on my back, my right side of my body is the one facing the door in my room, making this seem like there really was something there. The house I live in has a history of apparitions and noises of people walking and certain malicious spirits. They've been removed, though. I also still feel a residue. I'm typing this after waking, since I haven't been able to go back to sleep. White, dense fog in my living room. Hi, everyone. All my life, I've been able to perceive ghosts and spirits and even the true character of people. Often some bad entities would follow me to my place if I was feeling down or angry. So I've learned to placate my emotions. I don't give them any entrances in my home. The last three months I haven't seen anything weird at my place, but a couple of days ago I was walking toward the kitchen. I saw a dense white fog suspended in my living room above the table. It was static and it felt normal in the way that I didn't feel anything good or bad radiating from it. It was also spherical, but nowhere near perfect. I lived by the sea, so I thought this was a marine fog, but I realized the doors and windows were all closed and it was clear outside. The fog disappeared slowly in front of me told my boyfriend and yesterday he saw it while I was in the shower. He described it the same way, but this time the fog was not above the table, but above the kitchen counter. Do any of you know what that might be? Have you ever had a similar experience? Do you know if it's good or bad? What is this entity trying to communicate? Paranormal Experiences I do not know how to say this without sounding insane. But since I can remember, I've been on some weird, haunted, psychic shit. This goes from my childhood to me as an adult now. I'm relatively sane and emotionally sound. I have ADHD and dyslexia, and I'm in therapy. I typically don't mention my paranormal experiences due to the fact that I seem insane. It starts with my childhood home, built during the Great Depression. Here's all the known of the history. According to the previous owner, Mrs. H, a young girl, I'll call her E, met a violent death from a fall on the back porch. Because of this, the family sold the house to the H family. Mrs. H and Mr. H had a family followed by a long and happy life until Mr. H's death. Mr. H died from some lung condition caused by his time in a naval shipyard. I'm not quite sure when he died, but I do know that the dining room was turned into a hospice in the end. Then in 2002, when my family purchased this house from Mrs. H, once she moved to a retirement community. From my childhood, I remember my old dead grandfather in quotes. 
and a little girl in a smock dress and a bow in her hair. My mom can go on and on about the stories of younger me acknowledging and talking to my old dead grandfather and the imaginary friend all the siblings had. I could go on and on about these experiences, but I'll just share a few. As time went on, my whole family had paranormal encounters. Mine were primarily with Mr. H. Nothing really malicious happened or anything. It was kind of like he was watching over me when things got rough in my childhood. Another creepy thing that happened to me is sometimes I just get vibes, I guess. There's not really any other way to say it. Some places that I've walked by or been in sort of just give me a vibe. Most of the time it's not necessarily a negative thing, but on occasion it would be threatening or sad. I now work in EMS going on four years. It's hard to explain, but there's like a heavy and threatening vibe that comes with certain scenes. Three calls in my career have given me this quote-unquote vibe. One of which I walked in to discover a DOA by self-inflicted GSW. Upon investigation, he was a monster of a man, decided to end it to avoid prison, followed by two situations that were true crime documentary level homicides. In the town I work, there's four places that give me the heebie-jeebies. Two places that have given me vibes similar to the quote-unquote vibes. I rarely go around unless I'm dispatched to the surrounding area. Upon research, I discovered at two of those locations, the same SK killed a total of five people. After that, I decided I should stop looking into it. Shadow of my mom. I'm 24 years old and male. These stories are from when I was like five, six, or seven years old. It could be my brain, but I'm certain it happened. I was in bed and heard footsteps coming up the stairs. As usual, my mother would come to wish me a good night's sleep. Usually I'd be sleeping and would wake up briefly to say something back to her. But this time it felt strange. She came in, wished me a good night, went out. She closed the door. I was lying with my back to her when I turned around. What I saw was a shadow in the room. I started laughing and giggling because, well, that's mom. The shadow looked like my mother, but also not quite. It was very odd. She seemed older, taller, and thinner. After about two or three minutes, I ran to the shadow hugged it, and it laughed. It said something, but I don't remember what. I ran back to my bed and turned around. A minute later, I looked, and the shadow was gone. The next day, I went to Mom, and I asked, Why did you stay so long in my room? Mom looked genuinely a bit confused. What do you mean? I asked her several times about this years later, but she knows nothing about it. A mysterious encounter, sleepwalking, shadows, and unexplained events in the night. Anyone else experienced this? Long ago, my brother and I sometimes shared a room while on vacation. We would stay over together, we played games, and often gamed. My brother is known for sleepwalking, which usually happens in phases several times a year, a few weeks at a time. Once he ended up standing out of the shower before waking up. Another time he was descending the stairs, still asleep, misstepped and fell down. My parents found him downstairs, took him back up, treated his wounds, and he went back to sleep. About 15 minutes later he woke up and started crying. This story is about an autumn day. I had a Jip and Janicky, famous Dutch children's book. 
was a lamp hanging over my bed. It emitted a soft blue light. I woke up to knocking on my door. I didn't respond. After repeated pounding, I saw the door handle moving up and down. I remember lying in bed petrified. What? Why is this happening? Suddenly, the handle turned down, the door opened, and on the floor, I saw a figure. Not a shadow, but a sort of shape. An arm was in the air, fist clenched, it moved toward me in a worm-like motion faster than someone crawling or sneaking. Suddenly, the fist was beside my bed. I was terrified. What is this now? Every time I tried to move my hands to my head, the fist came between them and my head. It seemed to sense when I did this. It was truly bizarre. I think I haven't slept so badly in ages. It felt like hours, but realistically it was probably about three minutes. Then the fist lowered and the figure remained lying there. I didn't dare do anything. Gradually I fell back to sleep in silence. The next morning I looked on the floor and it was gone. I couldn't figure out if it was my brother or not, and I still can't. Still not entirely sure, but my brother and parents don't remember anything about it. What it was, I have no idea. Was it my brother? No idea. Maybe sleep paralysis. I genuinely don't know. Me neither. The Italian Lady That Haunted Our Old House When I was younger, my mom and I moved to Australia from South Africa when I was seven. We moved into this cute small cottage in a popular neighborhood. The house was old and a few areas were quite rusted. I remember that I would never go into the living room because it always terrified me. There was always some creepy, eerie aura in that room. About a few months into living in that house, I would wake up in the middle of the night due to loud, awful sounds coming from the kitchen. It sounded like pots and pans crashing into each other. I walked into the kitchen. There was nothing there, so I walked back to bed. This happened every day. A few days after my mom and I were talking about the weird noises when my mom said something that sent chills down my spine. Can you see her too? Those were the exact words my mom said. She told me she could see an old Italian lady in the kitchen hitting pots and pans together, furious, yelling at us to get out of her house. A month later, still hearing those sounds, my mom and I were meeting her neighbor at a coffee shop. My mom asked her if by any chance there was an old Italian lady that used to live in our house. Our neighbor then said, How do you know? She died the house just before you moved in. We were petrified. My mom then saw the lady again at night. She was more angry than ever. My mom, well, she told me the next morning that she told the lady that we're kind of safe people. And we'll protect her house never saw her again. The living room was no longer eerie or creepy either. The Peruvian Lady A few years ago I used to work in hospitality, so I could travel and earn money while I did it. I was working in a beautiful hotel in Peru. I've been working there for five months and absolutely loved it. One day I was working in reception. I was checking people into their rooms. And this one lady walks in. She had long brown hair, a black handbag, and a red shirt with what looked like weird stains on it. She had booked a room with four bedrooms. I thought it was a bit odd that she booked one of the biggest rooms and she's just one person. But I just assumed the other people were, you know... They were going to come later, perhaps. She was only going to stay for two nights. I gave her the keys and didn't see her for a while after that. The next day, everything was normal, and how my day usually went. 
but it was at night when things started to get weird. I got a phone call on my hotel's phone at around 10 p.m. At the same time, my personal phone started ringing. My phone said no caller ID. I ignored it and hung up. I could pick up my work phone. I picked up and it was the same lady I saw earlier. She was crying, saying she needed the ambulance. I asked why. She wouldn't stop weeping. She just kept begging me to call the ambulance. So I did and luckily, the hotel was only about a block away from a hospital. The ambulance quickly came and we went into a room where I'll never forget what I saw. There was blood everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. But that lady wasn't there. It was only blood. I got freaked out and I couldn't handle seeing the blood, so I went back to the desk downstairs, and on my desk I found an odd printed note. The note said, You'll need it later. Or something like that. Next to the note was a small clay bowl. Later I told my Peruvian friend about it and she said they used clay bowls as a source of protection from malevolent spirits. A few days later, I still have dreams about this lady all the time. I had a dream where I would see her again in a hotel room and she would just be standing, staring at me. It wasn't until I started working in another hotel where I saw her in the lobby. She looked the exact same. Red shirt was clean this time. I was petrified. She was smiling just like in my dream and I screamed and my colleague at the time ran over to me and asked what was wrong. I told her about the lady and she said, no one was there. Ghosty moving my shoes. I, a 28-year-old female, have had a lot of ghosty experiences. One of my most recent ones, though, involves my shoes being moved. At this point in time, I was working two jobs as a server. Double shifts Friday and Saturday, so 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. I just got home around 10.30ish. I was just exhausted. I had to be at work again the next day at 7 a.m., so I didn't do anything except come home, walk into my living room, drop my bag, keys, jacket, and arm my couch, take my shoes off by the side of the couch, let my dog out the slider connected to my living room, and turn around and walk down the hall to the bathroom to brush my teeth and whatnot. This was before locking up and heading to bed. For context, I sleep with my bedroom door closed. Always. No exceptions. Ever. My dog slept in my bedroom with me, in the bed most nights anyway, sometimes on the floor. Morning comes, my alarm didn't go off. I wake up already 30 minutes later than usual and bolt up in bed. I notice my bedroom door is slightly ajar. First I didn't think anything of it really, perhaps I was just too tired to notice that I didn't shut it all the way last night. Slowly crept open overnight. So I just crawl quickly out of bed, run to the bathroom to get ready quick. Once I'm done, I head to the living room to put my shoes on, grab a bag of keys, a jacket, etc. There's only one shoe. Super stressed because I'm already behind, I start frantically looking everywhere around the couch, under the couch, then the whole living room. No other shoe. I decided to just wear a different non-work pair of shoes because I'm late. Frustrated, I rush back into my room, get my dog up so that way I can go potty before I leave, and as I enter my room, I see my other shoe on the floor by the head of the bed, positioned as though if someone were wearing it, they'd be looking at me. I immediately get the chills, but I'm also still late, so I call for my doggo and leave, but I thought about how the hell my shoe got there basically the whole day. The next morning I woke up to find the shoes I wore the previous day instead of my work shoes in the hall, positioned as though someone were walking toward my bedroom. I also know that I 100% left them in the living room like I had wearing work shoes. About a week after this, my mom, we live in a split level, me downstairs, her upstairs, found one of her shoes on her hallway shelves.
bathroom ghosty experience. Okay, okay. Just to share one more story today. At one of my jobs during my first day, I had to wait with some of my new co-workers for my mom to get off. She had got me a job at the restaurant that she worked at. I had just moved to the area, and she had been there for a little over a year. We had carpooled. Anyway, my trainer and the other co-workers and I were closing the restaurant side of the place. The other side connected by a hallway and the two doorways was a bar. It was open for two more hours. After we finished closing up, I was sitting in the darkened restaurant at the table with two co-workers just chatting a bit, getting to know each other and whatnot. I excused myself to use the restroom, which is in the hall that connects the bar and the dining room area. That hall and the bathroom is close to the front door as well. The bathroom door was super heavy and opened fairly loudly with a creak and a whooshing sound that closed slowly due to the spring mechanism that it was connected to. It was also sort of a... Owie. It was also a great noise barrier. When someone opened it while you were inside the noise from the bar, it would be kind of much, much louder until it slowly closed. The bathroom used a motion sensor detector light, so it was off until I opened the door and walked in. To paint a picture, you walk in and to your left, the closet door is the sink. Then also on the left, but a bit further in, are three stalls. Two tiny first and then a large one, the family disabled. I know I was alone and I saw the tall, ugh, excuse me. I know I was alone as I saw the tall, Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Double messed up. I know I was alone as I saw the stall doors were open, and I have a habit of looking under for legs. I was in the first stall. As I finish peeing, the lights turn off. I'm startled by this, and I say something like, what the fuck? And right as I'm about to stand up and flush, in the now pitch black bathroom, there's four or five quick bangs on the stall door so hard the whole stall shook. It scared the absolute fucking hell out of me. I yell this time, what the fuck, not funny. But no giggling or other noise you'd expect from a new coworker or someone pulling pranks. Suddenly the light pops back on. I didn't hear the door open or close. Never heard footsteps or literally anything other than the banging. I feel super uneasy, actually frightened, and quickly leave the stall. Look in each of the other two stalls. I don't see anyone. I'm pretty positive I would have heard someone open the door if somebody had come in after me, or somehow were in there before me and left. I also wasn't in there for more than a few minutes. Seriously, probably only three minutes tops. I wash my hands quickly and try to leave, well, really trying to rationalize what happened. When I get back to where my coworkers and I had found our male coworker, I smile, thinking, ah, he must have been my female coworker. What? Aha. Okay, I'm going back a couple sentences. When I get back to where my co-workers and find only male co-worker, I smile thinking, aha, must have been my female co-worker and she's probably going to jump out at me and try to scare me again. I ask the male co-worker where female co-worker is and he says that she left out the back, opposite direction of bathroom, because it was late and she had to open the next day and to tell me bye. I sit down, confused and scared. Didn't say anything to anyone, but until a month or so in, I heard another coworker talking to a customer about weird experiences that she's had at the restaurant. She believed it to be haunted. Apparently, someone had killed themselves in the basement in, f well, this was back in the 40s when it was a small Martin or shop or something. Over the nine months of my working there, so many things happened, not only to me, but my other coworkers too. Definitely still could have been my coworkers pranking me. But no one ever owned up to it. I think that's a little weird if it was meant to be a prank. <laughs>